All right, what's going on, guys? This is Rob, and uh, because I'm on vacation this week, uh, we're picking up with part two of Remastering Adam, The Legend of Blue Marvel, because as most anybody who has been around this channel long enough knows, I absolutely love this story. And, and again, you know, like we said in the last video, it's really because of the fact there's just a lot of history here. One of the things to know, and 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 kind of picking up, for those of you guys who are joining us in this, this second video, again, I highly suggest you go back and watch the first video, but in the face of, of going against anti-man Connor Sims, it's one, a level of power that the Mighty Avengers are not used to, right? I mean, this guy even took the Century for a ride, which is no small feat, but also it's a villain they know nothing about. And that's one of the things to understand here is that most of the villains the superheroes face off against, they're aware of, even if they've somehow returned with a higher level of power than they had before. For. for example, someone like Michael Korvac or something like that, they at least know enough about him that they know how to approach the situation. Anti-Man is an anomaly. They know nothing about this guy. And so that's why the first thing that happens is you have Reed and you have uh, Tony Stark and you have uh, Hank Pym who basically meet up. Now, the other reason why this happens, and again, we talked about this in the last video, but it doesn't hurt to reiterate here, is that these are the three minds that are behind the initiative. Remember, this takes place almost immediately after the events of Civil War. So you still have the superhero initiative, like the 50s state initiative, that kind of a thing. And it was Hank and it was Reed and it was Pym that were instrumental in organizing and setting everything up and are really kind of the masterminds behind the show to a degree. But one of the things that happens and one of the things they talk about here is that in the fight between them, Anti-Man mentioned Blue Marvel. And that's when Hank Pym chimes in and says, wasn't there a hero from the early 60s that was named that guy that had that name? Now, this is one of the distinct things that I want to bring up here. Technically speaking, in terms of Marvel publishing, right? If we look at when Marvel published comics, Black Panther was the first black superhero in Marvel comics, or really the first black superhero with their own solo series. You can really look at Falcon and say he was the first one. But in terms of what's going on insofar as this being a retcon, a retroactive continuity, what Kevin Grievous is doing here is saying before Falcon ever became, or before uh, Sam Wilson ever became Falcon, before T'Challa ever showed up in the United States, there was Blue Marvel. So Blue Marvel is in fact the first black superhero to exist on Earth within the Marvel Universe continuity. So that's an important distinction to explain there. But it's also the way that he's able to get away with someone like Hank Pym saying, like, wasn't there a superhero in the 1960s who had that name? But the reality here is, it's one of these things where he's just kind of a lost superhero to a degree. He was before their time. They didn't really seem to focus on him all that much. And so in a lot of ways, Kevin Grievous is kind of asking us to suspend disbelief here. Because the reality is that having a superhero who saves the world from an asteroid the size of Kansas, that's not something that you just forget, right? Like, remember that guy that saved the Earth from total obliteration by, like, a giant meteor? What was that guy's name? I mean, obviously, they would remember who this guy is. So there's a little bit of suspension of disbelief that goes on here. But at the end of the day, what they also come to realize is that, uh, based on Reed Richards and him analyzing the entirety of the fight, the situation, things like that, that this guy, Anti-Man, is basically based on antimatter technology, right? Like, literally, antimatter energy. Essentially, what we're saying is that this guy is potentially powered by an infinite source of energy. He uses it as fuel. So imagine how Galactus uses the power cosmic, an infinite source of energy. That's what Anti-Man is, except he uses antimatter energy. Now, he's kind of an unfinished product, right? He's kind of one of these things where he's not the perfected version of this. And in fact, we'll get more into that when we talk about the origin of Adam Brashear and so on. And so what happens here is one thing to remember, in the aftermath of Civil War, Tony Stark became director of S.H.I.E.L.D. And so the first thing he does is he says, okay, let's access S.H.I.E.L.D. technology, let's access their database and find out who this guy is. The problem is that all information pertaining to Adam Brashear is classified above top secret. Not even Tony Stark can access it, even as director of S.H.I.E.L.D. And remember, as director of S.H.I.E.L.D., this guy's got basically access to the world's information that's out there, right? So the NSA, the KGB, everything, every intelligence agency that exists in the world, S.H.I.E.L.D. has access to their databases and he still can't find this guy, right? He's like literally cross-reference everything, the name Adam Brashear, with every current piece of information that exists out there, all known files and references with S.H.I.E.L.D., the Fantastic Four, the X-Men, the Avengers, the whole nine yards, and it's negative results. And he says cross reference with NSA, CIA, FBI, through Interpol, Link International, intelligence organizations, the MI6, right, the DGSE, Mossad, KGB, like everything. And like it's scan, scan, scan. And there's just 
a single KGB file this linked to the NSA, but he can't get to it, right? So what one little crumb he found in relation to this guy doesn't exist. And the reality is that it's all locked away due to executive order BM349. That's a presidential decree. And so what this means is the president of the United States at the time locked away any and all information pertaining to Blue Marvel and no one can access it. And so that's when he's kind of like, what are the Blue Marvel protocols? And that's when he's basically given access to this. And he's like, what in the hell is going on? And so as he starts reading through these to a degree, he gets a bit of information. We're not given the full totality of the information he gets. And even the information that Tony Stark gets is not as in its full totality. So the only thing he does is the only thing he really can do. He goes and visits Dum Dum Dugan. Now, the reason why he does this is one, because Nick Fury's always gone. You can never find the guy. And two, because Dum Dum Dugan served during S.H.I.E.L.D. at that point in time. He was basically was like boots on the ground when everything with Blue Marvel was happening. And so that's when he's like, I need you to tell me everything you know about the Blue Marvel protocols. And the response of Dum Dum Dugan is, leave it alone. You do not want to go down this rabbit hole, Tony Stark. Like, you do not want to go down this whole path. This is going to lead you to a place that you don't want to be in. There's a reason why Blue Marvel and everything regarded to it was swept under the rug, right? I mean, literally, it's one of these things where Stark's like, you were part of this cover-up, right? Literally, like, kind of interrogates him. And then in the end, Dugan's response is like, talk what you know, Shellhead. I had nothing to do with it, and neither did Fury, if that's what you were thinking, right? Fury had no real hand in the way that, that Blue Marvel was blackballed and the way that we saw it done in the first issue and he says neither of us agreed with that but in the end you need to leave this alone, right? You need to walk away from this. This is not something that you need to have any involvement in. And so what he does here is he sends him in the direction of a guy by the name of Kroots. Now, he doesn't dump all this information here. He simply says, that's the guy that can give you the kind of details that you're looking for, or at least he can give you the, the gritty details that I simply just can't give you. Because one of the things to remember is that while Dum Dum Dugan was there, his information is really kind of limited to what Nick Fury passed on to him and like word of mouth, which for the most part was relatively accurate. But there's a difference between being the guy who's on the outside looking in and being the guy who was on the inside. And that's what Kroots was. He was there at the ground level when it was all happening. So what happens is Tony Stark travels to Falls Church, Virginia, and he meets up with Kroots. Now, here's one of the things that I want to specify in this. Kevin Grievous does not really shy away from the racial issues that plagued the United States in the 1960s. And in fact, Kroots is presented to us as essentially a holdover from that era, right? From that time period, a reminder of how people functioned at that point in time and so when tony stark starts asking him questions like do you know what's going on with blue marvel and all that kind of stuff that what really happens here is he says yep you know he's like i'm well aware of all of this stuff right like there was literally this guy right when anti-man first showed up the blue marvel took him down hard and so the response to stark is so the blue marvel saved lives and you got rid of him anyway and in the end Kroot's response well it was just a different it was a different time right it was a different time period and he says like i'm not proud of of what I've done, Stark. Like, I know how it was that I used to think, and I know the things that I've said about colors. And in response, Stark corrects him and says African Americans, and the response of Kroots is, whatever. Now, while Kroots is not really being, uh, being depicted here as the racist he was in the 1960s, the reality is he hasn't necessarily moved on. He still lives to a degree in the way things were before. And that's why he says things like he refers to Adam Brashear as boy, right? He's like, that Brashear boy was dangerous. And where Stark's like, why are you referring to him as a boy? The response of Kroots is like, dude, are we, are we really going to go through this time and time again? And the reason why this is a, a significant moment here is because what it's showing is generational differences, right? To Kroots, this is just common nomenclature. It's common phrase. It's no different than you and I saying, man, that's cool, right? Whereas to Tony Stark, it's like, that's old school, man. It's an old archaic way of thinking. And it is by all standards of measurement, racist, right? But in the end, Tony Stark wants information more than he wants to correct Kroots' way of thinking. Besides, Kroots is already on his deathbed. The guy's not long for this world anyway. So Kroots really starts to come clean with the stuff that he knows. And he says, Brashear scared the living crap out of everybody. It was 1962. We were scared of everything back then. Aliens, Russians, right? The red Chinaman, Negro rights, right? That kind of a thing. And he's, and, and in the end, the response of Stark is like, the world was changing and you could have done the same. And that's where Kruitz responds and saying, what the hell do you think would have happened to this country, to the world, if they knew that there was a colored man running around
around who could lay waste to a continent. Now, this is a point he makes, not necessarily as a disparaging mark to Adam Brashear, but in saying at that point in time in the United States that, that he makes a point in saying it was a country of like legal segregation that institutionalized hate characterized a lot of people. What Adam Brashear represented was not necessarily the idea that a black man could rise to prominence. What he represented was progress. And it was the kind of progress that a lot of people at that point in time simply didn't want to see. Now you take that progress and then you in turn put it in the hands of an indestructible man. And what that represents is progress that can't be stopped. Progress that cannot be prevented. And that's the fear that Kreutz and people like him had at that point in time. He said, what if Rashir had turned against us? Suppose he was more like Gabriel Prosser or Malcolm X. Now, for those of you guys who don't know who Gabriel Prosser was, he was a blacksmith during the age of slavery who planned a slave rebellion. Malcolm X, we know who Malcolm X is, right? His name speaks for itself. And he says nuclear missiles were not going to stop this guy. So we had to do something. And then he said there was another issue that was going on. Now, what it does is it switches to the Pentagon war room in 1962, where they're having a conversation with Bolivar Trask. Now, this is one of the best things that I loved about this story is the way that Kevin Grievous rolled all this in. When they're having this conversation with Trask, the initial concern here is that perhaps Adam Brashear is a mutant. And in doing so, it represents a clear and present danger. And that while, while you know, Bolivar Trask says, I'm not saying that, Mr. President, but I do know that the presence of superhumans like the Blue Marvel proves that there is a microevolutionary change taking place within the human genome that allows for such being to exist. And he says simply that the problems we face with the Blue Marvel are only the beginning and appear in the coming year, or at least will expand in the coming years, the superheroes will present a credible threat, not just for our world and our country, but for all over this world itself, from different races and socioeconomic strata as well. And that's when, with all this information that's being given, right, that like this whole representative idea of Blue Marvel, people gaining powers and becoming essentially unstoppable, that it could destabilize the entire planet, could change the face of the Cold War, or create a new kind of war altogether. Communism could be the least of their concerns. And when they ask, what do we do, Trask? He says, in my opinion, Admiral, we must remain vigilant. We have to be wide awake. We have to control the coming storm. The response to Stark in here saying, so that's how Project Wide Awake began, a whisper in the dark by men afraid of what they don't understand. That's the origin of it all. Now, the funny thing about this is for those of you guys who aren't familiar with Project Wide Awake, it's one of the coolest concepts ever in the history of Marvel Comics. So with Project Wide Awake, the way this played out is that in the old school Chris Claremont days, it was really a Bolivar Trask concept, but it was also just this massive and huge multi-intelligence organizational apparatus, right? The nature behind Project Wide Awake at its core was to contain and control the mutant threat, but you also got things like the Commission on Superhuman Activities. So Project Wide Awake extended beyond simply just mutants and then expanded to the idea of superheroes. The Commission on Superhuman Activities, for example, was the organization that fired Steve Rogers as Captain America, arguing that the Captain America name was owned by the government and replaced Steve Rogers with John Walker, US agent, who basically turned out to be a shit show. So they brought Steve Rogers back because literally John Walker was killing people. But the whole thing behind this is that the, the Project Wide Awake initiative, that entire program started at like the President of the United States. It stretched down to state legislatures, right? So members of the House and the Senate, intelligence organizations, the CIA, the FBI, state and local sheriff's office, local, like, local police force, the whole nine yards. It was just this gigantic task that had been undertaken by the federal government to contain and control the mutant threat. So that's where you got guys like Henry Peter Geirich, Bolivar Trask developing the initial or the original Sentinel program. When he was essentially taken out of the picture, Project Wide Awake at the hands of the federal government moved the Sentinel program into the hands of Stephen Lang, not related to Scott Lang, by the way, but that's what led to the Sentinels as you most commonly know them, especially if you ever watched X-Men, the animated series, but it was a great big, huge venture. What Kevin Grievous came in and did in this story, which I loved, is he said, it all started with the Blue Marvel. That the Blue Marvel popped up as a black superhero in the 1960s, scared the hell out of the government, and in response, as an act of desperation, the government turned to Bolivar Trask, and that's where Project Wide Awake came from. So it was a really, really cool idea, because in return, or at least in this whole thing, you have this, this idea where Stark's just like, a, like the entirety of Project Wide Awake was a policy of fear and repression. And the response of, of Cruz is like, well, it happens. And that pisses off Stark to no end, right? Because he's like, you put this guy in a box and you threw the key away just so you could sleep at night. And for no other reason than the fact that it was a skin color. Because the reality here is that if this was like a white guy who popped 
popped up, nobody would have been as scared. They wouldn't have hit the panic button the way that they did. And if anything, the desire would have been to reel that guy in. There's a couple ways that we know that. We know that because of the fact that Steve Rogers, Captain America, was the original Weapon 1, right? If you go back and you read uh, Grant Morrison's new X-Men, one of the first things he establishes is that the desire to create super soldiers, that was Captain America, to contain and control the mutant threat at the very early outset of Project Wide Awake, right? Before Project Wide Awake actually became Project Wide Awake. Then when you had this realization that people have been popping up historically with mutant powers, that the early stages, right? You could kind of call it the precursor to Wide Awake, came in the form of Weapons Plus. Captain America was Weapon 1. World War II was a field test. And the whole intention was to see how he would play out in a combat scenario. And if he performed admirably, he'd be brought back to the United States, his mind would be wiped, and he would be turned into an anti-mutant, or at least the first in a series of anti-mutant police force type guys, right? Super soldiers that would allow them to contain and control that threat. As we know, Captain America was frozen in ice. So without his location being known by the various, by really anybody out there in the world, Weapons Plus turned to Weapons 2 and 3 and 4 and 5 and 6, running all the way up to Weapon X, Wolverine, and then the ones that came after that. Step for Cuckoos, Deadpool, Phantom X, all that kind of stuff. So it's one of these things where like, if someone like Captain America or somebody like uh, Nuke, for example, Frank Simpson, those were acceptable and they were used by the federal government to achieve a goal. Whereas when it came to Adam Brashear, it was lock this guy up and throw away the key. We got to kick him out because this guy's dangerous, right? So Kevin Grievous draws this clear parallel between the fact of, or really between the, the skin color of Adam Brashear and the response of the federal government. And so in the end, the statement that, that Crude says here is that all you hypocritical liberals are all alike. You want the world to read like a Mother's Day card, but you don't want to do what's necessary to keep it safe. A safe world costs something. Somebody somewhere out there has to pay the piper when the bill comes due. And so at the end of the day, what he says is like in order to close the book on Adam Brashear, right? Because it wasn't enough for the president to just give him the Presidential Medal of Freedom and send him on his way, that there had to be some kind of a response. There had to be something that went on and so far is removing this guy from the equation. So what the president did is he sent him on a final mission that there was basically an alien scout that they had determined here. Now, this alien is not overly important for this conversation. It will be later on, but not right now. But there was an alien scout that had shown up and Adam Brashear was sent into space despite the fact that he had been asked to step down by the president as a final mission, which Adam Brashear accepted. Because remember, the stance of Adam is that he is a protector of the world, not really a protector of any one particular race. And that in this fight between the two, that what had happened is they were hoping that these guys would kill each other. That what it would do is it would lead to Adam Brashear dying at the hands of this alien and vice versa and just kind of rid them of this entire situation. That didn't happen. Instead, what ended up taking place is the energy signature of Adam Brashear started just hitting this kind of fever pitch and then they never saw him again. And that was it, right? And so the response of Stark is okay. So like the Avengers were almost killed by anti-man out there and the, the only one that we know of could, that could have defeated this guy, your bigotry got him killed. Right? And so in the end of the day, Kruitz is like, you haven't been listening, right? Not 20 people knew about that alien encounter, but we were able to use part of it to bury the truth and add a layer to the cover story. It made the Blue Marvel's disappearance of the world more credible if anyone ever dug too deep. And so when Stark asked, what are you talking about? The response to this guy was, we had an alternative, right? The protocol files were incomplete and he gives the protocol files directly to Tony Stark. And so what this does is it switches over to Silver Spring, Maryland, where you have a woman, of course, who's basically there, but like, of course, there's a knock at the door, there's Tony Stark. And when they ask her, or at least when they start talking to her, we find out this woman's name is Mrs. Brashear, right? This is the wife of Adam. And in one of the most interesting, if not crazy moments in this story, they ask her, do you know where your husband is, right? Is he in? And she's like, no, he's a class. Like, you're Tony Stark, right? And he's like, yeah, you know? And she's like, what's what's all of this, you know, to do with? And he's like, well, it's just a matter, a matter of national security, ma'am. You know, and she's like, this is ridiculous. You can't simply just barge into our home and start doing this. And he says, Miss Frazier, I don't have time for that. And when her response is, why did you call me that? He's like, Marlene Frazier, Agent 314. That's your real name, right? Your code name is Agent 314. That's correct, right? And she tries to play it off like she doesn't know what she's talking about. And he's like, the world needs Blue Marvel. This exchange here on the surface is Tony Stark kind of being like, I mean, look, we, we know what's going on, right? Like, you know, but the reality is what he's doing is effectively blackmailing her. He's tugging at those strings. He's like, we know you started out as an agent of she 
Brasio. We know you're not actually the wife of Adam Brashear. I mean, you are, but, but things aren't necessarily what they seem. So either you can help us out here or we can leak it to your husband about what's going on, right? It's really strong arm in here. And so as a, as a response, of course, she ends up calling up Adam Brashear and then basically letting him know, hey, like the federal government's looking for you again right? Like they're trying to find you. So with that being said, guys, we're going to bring this to an end. Thank you all for watching and I will catch you all later. Peace.